expert. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dan. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to talk with you. It's wonderful to have you. You know, I was looking back at the series and I am very passionate about renewable energy. And I know a lot of people interested in sustainability are, and I put solar panels on my own house, but it is always a struggle to find information. So when I found you, I was so happy and you're doing all your information in English and Japanese. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started with this business? Yeah, sure. So I, um, you know, I have a, a previous company I worked for collapsing abruptly uh, to thank in part for my decision to, to take a jump in, uh, in this direction. So I had been uh, working several years uh, in the deregulated electricity market here, going back to, uh, 2016, since which time, you know, you have the opportunity, the option to say, I want to go buy my power from SoftBank or JCom or Rakuten or any number of companies other than the regional utility you used to have to buy from. And uh, about two years ago, uh, I started my own company and it just happened to be at this really interesting moment where the feed-in tariff program, which led to most of the uh, solar de development we've seen in the last decade, um, was tapering off. And so uh, it really, it was exactly what you said. It was the question of availability of information. Uh, I saw this gap in terms of the amount of activity activity happening on the Japanese side, particularly the Japanese government side, in trying to map out the different ways we go forward from here and what was available in English. And that was, you know, particularly important, I, I thought, because, um, you know, the, the feed-in tariff program attracted so many, uh, so much investment from overseas. And so I figured they have to want to stay involved, but the the information isn't there. So uh, that was sort of the, the inspiration uh, that started it. That's great. Well, I'm so happy to connect and get some of your expertise. Um, so much of it is confusing but I would refer anybody who's interested in this topic to sign up for your free, free newsletter, or right. you have a monthly 500 yen more in-depth market analysis type of newsletter. Uh, uh, that, that's, yeah. 500, uh, that's 500 US. Just don't want anyone to be surprised <laughs> when they go there and they think it's going to be 500 yen. Or, uh, uh, yen but, yeah. yeah. Oh, $500 US. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, very big difference there. Uh, one of, but there is a free option as well, and then you also offer more uh, company-specific or area-specific consulting services as well. Is that right? Correct. So first, first of all, yes, we we try to make a lot of information available for free, and uh, and meaningful quality information, not just a single news headline and then uh, telling you to come pay us for our consulting. We, we blog uh, about um, some of the most, what we believe are some of the most important interest uh, issues happening in the market. Uh, some of them are really complicated. We try to make them uh, understandable um, with, without dumbing them down to the point that they lose meaning. And um, yeah, so, but ultimately um, we're a consulting company. Yeah, that's great. And it looks like you've got a great team that you work together with. One of the things that um, I have thought about but never seen clear information about, and I know this is becoming more and more of an issue. Uh, we saw this in America with Texas and the grid problems, California and the grid problems. We know there are grid problems um, with even different frequencies of power from grid to grid in Japan. 
Um, so tell us a little bit about this microgrid and the grid. Can you just give us an overview of this? Sure. So microgrids, um, broadly speaking, the grid is the grid as an abstract thing is divided into high frequency transmission. And that's the big towers you see in Japan. They're always red and white. And that's where you see the wires really sagging in between. And then there uh, at substations, the voltage of the power is stepped down. And then that's your local distribution network. So um, broadly speaking, what uh, a microgrid is, is it's a, a local distribution grid that includes generation within that grid so uh when for whatever reason uh there are problems in the larger grid uh could be um natural disaster storms whatever uh is the case excuse me the local grid can be islanded from the larger grid and um and continue to operate with the uh the local uh generation assets that are in that area so it provides uh improved resilience against uh natural disasters um it also um what once all the market design uh and regulations are in place uh it should also incentivize the development of more smaller local power plants, what we call distributed energy resources, um, which uh, which ultimately is important for a number of reasons. First, because spreading things around on a smaller scale locally does provide more resilience. You have uh, less eggs in the single basket of a large plant. 50 kilometers away, then there's only one high voltage line between you and there. Um, but then uh, also it's um, in a perfect world, it's going to create incentives for more renewables plants, which are smaller than those, the mega solar plants we saw being developed under the feed-in tariff over the last uh, 10 years. There's not that much land left to build mega solar plants. So finding ways to uh, incentivize a larger number of smaller plants around the country is going to be important. Yeah, it, it just seems like a really good um, way forward. So when we put solar on our roof, uh, we didn't, we don't have battery technology to catch what we don't use. Mm -hmm. So excess from our house is sold to the grid. And that's what you were talking about before the feed in tariff. We used to get more than twice what we were paying back from the electric company. And that helped pay off our solar panels a lot faster. Um, you mentioned that it's kind of transitioning away from feed in tariff that system to a new feed-in premium. Um, I'd love to talk about that in a moment. But if, for example, I'm in a community and everybody has solar panels on the roofs, some of our roofs more efficient than others, we can share power amongst each other, you could really have a very self-sufficient neighborhood. Um, That's in right. this, and, and more resilient, like you say, um, if the big grid is having trouble, you could cut off and support each other. It's kind of, it's really exciting to think that that might be possible. Yeah, it's it's very compelling, especially after um, two years ago, the 2019 uh, typhoons, 15 and 19, we saw um, power outages on a, a larger scale and for a longer time than we were used to. So part of what came out of that was the uh, government ordering the utilities to be better prepared, um, better coordinated with their uh, their local engineering contractors and so forth, and to be more transparent about the process of getting everyone 
back online. But it also led the government to say, we're going to create a new system to uh, a, a new business type, a distribution grid operator, uh, which doesn't exist uh, in, the, in the current market structure. And it's going to take years to implement this. But ultimately, we could see um, the utilities uh, selling off chunks of their distribution grid to other companies who want to install uh, local generation, maybe um, encourage uh, more people to have rooftop solar like you, and then create these, uh, these largely self-sustaining and more resilient uh, local energy communities. But what we have already seen and uh, got more attention thanks to the mess we encountered uh, in the fall of 2019, is that although uh, on, the, on the large scale, the regulations and market structure are not in place to allow for this, there are um, uh, exceptional cases where, um, where it's worked out, such as uh, Miyakojima, in uh, you know way way uh, west in um, in Okinawa prefecture, where they are not uh, they're not the first of all the Okinawa grid is not connected to the rest of the grid in Japan, and then within Okinawa you have remote islands like Miyakojima not connected to the main Okinawa grid, and uh, Okinawa Electric Power Company had been losing um, lots of money for years and years and years because they had to bear the cost of shipping fuel for the power plant plants out to those islands. Uh, and they couldn't pass that through to the ratepayer. So when uh, a local company together with the Miyakojima government came and said, uh, look, we're gonna build solar plants. We want to break off a microgrid here, and they've since done other things. I believe they've add, added storage and a variety of other digital technologies. Uh, Okiden, rather than viewing this as a chunk of their business being taken away, viewed it as a positive offset for a money losing segment of their business. So between now and the time that the distribution license system comes into effect, I think, uh, one, we're going to see more uh, attention being put on these exceptional cases. And two, I think we're going to see um, more facilitation of, uh, of those cases, uh, both in terms of government subsidies uh, and in terms of um, who knows, in, in, in some cases, maybe the uh, regional utilities will be um, just a little more accommodating if they see kind of which way the winds of change are blowing and it's just a good thing for them to be taking part in. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I grew up on Hawaii. And so once we got our solar panels here and we had this good feed in tariff system, we were feeling very supported by the government. And then I went back to Hawaii and I realized how crazy it was in Hawaii that they're importing so much oil and it's the perfect place for solar and wind. Why isn't this moving ahead? So it's so nice to see, like you said, Miyakojima, beautiful island in the Okinawa South area of Japan. Of course, Japan's an island. But we don't think of it in that way. We think of the grid being our only connection to energy. So kind of this lateral thinking movement is really encouraging. Yeah, it's it's exciting. And there's uh, there's a lot of hard work to be done, uh, both at, um, you know, an engineering and construction level and at the level of um, regulation and market design, the things that will make make these things economically viable because um, the government can't just uh, um, hold a gun to the head of industry and say, do this. But, um, but I think we're starting to see um, movement in that 
direction. The, the difficult thing is um, that, uh, well, one among many difficult things is that the feed-in tariff, especially in its earlier years, uh, provided such a high level of certainty about the returns investors were going to see. And it's really kind of a set and forget system. You build your plant, you connect it to the grid, the utility in that area has to buy all that power from you, send it through their lines for 20 years at an above market price. Um, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's not going to be completely on a uh, commercial competition basis. There are still some subsidies available, but it's going to be much more, it's gonna be moving towards a truer market environment. And part of why that's difficult is that the idea of the idea behind government incentive programs for renewables is that over the course of the incentive period, uh, prices, costs should be coming down. Uh, that can be uh, in terms of the, the technology itself, the manufacturing processes, economies of scale, uh, all kinds of uh, different aspects. And that has certainly happened with the panels themselves. But uh, here in Japan, um, for the larger plants uh, where, where you have a, a lot of costs that are not simply the panels, um, the construction costs are just really stubborn that you can, so far we can only get them down to, to a certain level. And as a result, um, solar is not quite ready to be weaned completely off of, uh, you know, a government support system. You hear in other, a lot of other countries, maybe not a lot, but a handful of, uh, you know, some significant European countries, parts of the US that, well, yeah, just build solar. It's the cheapest thing now. Um, not quite that simple and straightforward uh, here yet. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I didn't realize that it was the price difference or the value itself of solar or wind was so different in Japan compared to other economies. Um, let's take a step back a little bit and talk about uh, renewable energy in general in Japan. So on your website, you have all this great data, great blog, lots of information, which is freely available to everyone. And you talk about the growth of non-hydro renewables in Japan as well as the 2050 targets. And I think because of this latest IPCC report, everybody's kind of got in mind 2050 carbon neutrality is get real. It's becoming a, real, a reality for a lot of businesses or policymakers as well. Could you just talk about these a little bit? Sure thing. So first of all, you point out this issue of quote unquote non-hydro renewables. Um, Japan uh, has a, a substantial amount of uh, hydropower. I want to say it's about something like 8% of total power generation in the country. And the growth in renewables we've had during the post Fukushima feed-in tariff era has been uh, primarily non-hydro and primarily solar. Um, so the issue, the reason they're viewed as being kind of different is so uh, hydro plants are typically really large. So we're talking about sort of lo really large civil works projects that cost hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars and take years to complete. And that's, um, that's not really what is um, trying to be stimulated under the, you know, this renewables growth program. It doesn't mean that there aren't still uh, interesting questions about could, uh, could a larger dam, could another large dam be built here or there, but it's pretty much built out 
already. So only, I, I believe only uh, small hydro is being uh, incentivized at this point. So anyway, that's, that's a slightly long-winded way of uh, explaining why they're viewed as uh, separate. This, uh, we're talking about primarily solar, but also wind, uh, especially offshore wind, which is still in its, its early days uh, here in Japan, but that is one area where the feed-in tariff remains high to incentivize uh, development. And then there are other things like biomass and geothermal, which get uh, a little more complicated to talk about. Um, but to tie that to um, what you just mentioned about the 2050 net decarbonization goal, um, it's uh, it's been what that's really going to mean is kind of unfolding gradually. First, last fall, the the new prime minister's administration it announced the 2050 net zero goal. Uh, earlier this year, announced a uh, goal of 46 percent decarbonization as compared with the peak emissions year of 2013 by the end of this decade, 2030. And then um, it's like sort of, okay, that's all great. How, how are we getting from here to there? And just uh, in July, the government, uh, Medi, released uh, a new, um, what's called the, the sixth revision of the basic energy plan, um, which actually we're just uh, writing about uh, this month. And so we're going to have uh, an update to the, uh, to the two right side um, portions of the, uh, of the graph you're showing now. Um, so the, the targets for renewables uh, have been revised upward for 2030. Um, but here, here's, here's where it starts to get really interesting with sort of like, um, it's almost like, you know, uh, squaring the circle, um, that, so we're looking, the, the renewables target for 2030 had been 22 to 24% of generation. And sometime last year, uh, some, uh, some significant uh, investment advisory firms said that they thought we were already on track to exceed and hit 27% by 2030. The government has now set uh, a new target uh, of 36 to 38%. Um, but and we're already at about 18%. So um, it, again, it comes back to the feed-in tariff uh, tapering off. Um, then another interesting issue is, so we hear all about offshore wind, which is indeed being developed, but uh, at this point, it looks like having a really significant amount of develop, uh, generation from offshore wind by 2030 feels kind of over-optimistic. And we hear all about hydrogen, but hydrogen is something that has to be made using power. So uh, it ha preferably that should be uh, green power. Um, so we're talking about the possibility of needing to import uh, huge amounts of uh, hydrogen from overseas, um, which even if we assume that the economics gets there, that's still just a, a huge um, uh, engineering infrastructure undertaking. So those those things feel more applicable to maybe where we can be in 2050, not to how we can get to this 46% reduction goal 
in 2030. So it's really interesting if you look at the new basic energy plan beyond just these percentage targets for different generation types. But if you look at it in terms of the forecast uh, total power demand, previously we had been anticipating uh, an increase in power demand by 2030. Uh, makes sense when we're talking about electrifying everything, right? You're gonna have, you're not gonna be burning as much gasoline, you're gonna be charging batteries instead. But what we see now with this first um, revision of the energy plan since these decarbonization targets were set is that the government is calling for a decrease in power demand between now and 2030, and then allowing it to rise again out to 2050, um, sort of in tandem with those larger scale technologies for clean power, hopefully having become scalable by then. So what this means is that energy efficiency is going to be a big part of how the government envisions us uh, achieving these uh, interim goals for 2030. Yes, adding more renewables is going to be part of it. And in the government's plans, bringing a lot of nuclear plants back on is going to be part of it. Um, but we're going to see we're going to see pressure for the reduction of power usage. And there are different ways you can do that, right? But I mean, back in the US where you and I come from, you can provide consumer incentives for people, uh, you know, choosing Energy Star appliances that use less power or whatever. You know, there are all kinds of things you can do, but um, we're probably talking at a larger level than is going to be achieved by just people buying, you know, new refrigerators, right? So it, it seems like all the emphasis, like many problems with environmentalism, so much emphasis is on the end user instead of the corporate change or the big government changes that which would have a really big effect right away. Um, all the pressure is on the consumer. Oh, you need to upgrade your appliance. That's going to make a big, of course, that makes a difference. But if we're talking about huge changes, um, we need to get, you know, big corporate involved, big governments to change. Uh, one thing I want to touch on before we pass on is about uh, the idea of power demand and supply, because this was a big issue after Fukushima and Fukushima went offline and TEPCO was telling everybody, oh, we're going to have power outages and that never happened. And the, like you said, they kind of, maybe they've learned over time that they don't need to have as much d uh, access to power as they expected before. But recently, last year, and the same thing happened in Texas, um, there was a huge spike in cost to energy users, especially for me, we have solar, but we also buy energy from one of the uh, companies you mentioned on your website, She's in, and our prices just went through the roof uh, in winter because of the way the energy market works. Um, so would you mind just talking about that for a little bit? It seems like Shizen and other companies have now figured out a way to regulate that. Um, but I think it's a really interesting system about how renewable energy or energy at all in Japan is bought and sold. Yeah, so this is part of the deregulated market we've had since uh, 2016. So the when we were all on TEPCO or KEPCO or Chu, uh, Chugoku or whoever, they, uh, they sell regulated rates because they, they, were, they were regulated monopolies, which means that they go in front of Medi, show their costs, 
and Medi says, okay, we accept that those are your costs. And there's a, a, a fixed percentage on top for profit. So, okay, your costs have gone up. So we're going to allow you to charge more now. Um, but this wasn't something they could do on a daily basis. This is something every few years they go in front of the government and make their case for it. Now we have um, a system in which uh, all of these new retail companies, uh, they can set their rates as they see fit. That's why they, in, in normal circumstances, not the circumstances you're talking about last winter, uh, they're generally offering a little bit of a, a discount on what you get from the old regulated utility rates. Um, but they, uh, the, these new retailers are largely procuring their power on a wholesale market called JEPIX. The Japan Electric Power Exchange. Uh, a large number of these retailers are not generating any of their own power. So they are exposed to wholesale market prices. Um, a perfect um, a perfect storm of circumstances um, that has really kind of has to do with um, essentially with Japan's dependence on liquefied natural gas and then some bottlenecks in the supply chain happening to line up just when we were having a cold snap. That's what sent the, the prices um, spiraling uh, upwards. But from the consumer perspective, um, here's, um, here's what I would like to uh, trumpet uh, from the mountaintops to electricity consumers in Japan is that uh, you may not have noticed, and in fairness, your electricity supplier might not have done a good enough job of really highlighting it to you, that um, mostly they're offering month to month variable rate plans. That means it's totally within their prerogative to say, we're gonna charge you a higher rate next month, or we're gonna charge you a lower rate next month or whatever may be the case. And we didn't really notice this as consumers for the first few years of the deregulated market because the market remained, uh, there wasn't a lot of volatility. When we saw price spikes, it would be on the scale of a few hours at a time, like during um, uh, the like 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. during this month of the year when we all have the AC on and demand is high. Uh, and that tends to, th those price spikes tended to be short enough and predictable enough that, um, most retailers could manage them without passing the price along to consumers. However, uh, this was on an entirely different order of magnitude, what happened uh, last winter. Um, and obviously, um, the retailers have made uh, different decisions about how to deal with this. Uh, a small number of them a very small number were sophisticated enough in their portfolio strategies and their risk management that they could actually withstand these um, price spikes. Uh, a lot were hit hard by them. Um, I, I think many decided only to pass part of the cost on to the consumer. Um, I think that was the case for us as well, even though it was a big spike for us. Uh, I know that Shizen was taking a big hit themselves, trying to cover as much as they could, but they that, still lost a lot of customers who lost faith in the system, right? That's right. That's right. And um, there are, uh, 
when you look beyond this perfect storm of circumstances that precipitated it, and you look more at the background conditions that it existed, um, one was that um, I think uh, the retailers, those buying a lot of power exposed to prices on this wholesale market, were just kind of in a state of maybe call it delusion uh, that okay it's been it's been pretty stable the first few years of the market well um, something being stable fits really well with how Japan likes to think of itself so maybe um, the blinders were on a little bit about the idea that circumstances could change and things things could get volatile um, and then the other is there are some um, market transparency issues um, where um, basically, um, you know, information about what's going on in the market, uh, availability of generation capacity in different locations, um, the uh, transmission of power from one grid zone uh, to another, like say between Tohoku and Hokkaido. Um, these things, uh, whatever the actual current status is, is not being reflected quickly enough. And so uh, this can contribute to prices spiraling higher and higher. So Medi has really been harping hard on the uh, the market participants needing to grow up and learn about hedging and risk management. And there is something to be said for that, but um, I'm very much hoping to see Medi take some strong action on uh, creating the, the type of transparency in the market, which, um, uh, you know, it's the, the lack of transparency didn't cause this, but it sure was that last little bit of lighter fluid that really shot it skyward. Yeah, transparency in so many things when we're talking about sustainability is so important. Uh, talking about the energy mix in Japan, uh, just going back a little bit, you've got this great graph here. Uh, talking about geothermal and hydro, thermal and wind. By thermal, is that nuclear? Thermal is a generic term that is generally used to refer to hydrocarbon fueled power plants. And whether or not you're referring, it, it refers to heat being used to boil water to spin a turbine. So that's what happens in uh, coal plants. I guess in a lot of gas plants, it doesn't actually have water involved, but there's uh, you're spinning a turbine and it happens in nuclear plants. Whether or not you- Biomass also in that same category? Biomass, there are several different kinds. So, so that's, an, that's a great point is that's another one where yeah technically it should probably be grouped there but <laughs> it's um, so confusing it is. It? and then also you know in in some places um they talk about carbon free power sources and so then you get renewables grouped together with nuclear so it's kind of a it's kind of a question of slicing and dicing oh. I, don't know if we have um, uh, uh, you know this particular graph you're showing, which is about environmental impact assessments involved in building the plants. I don't know if we have anything better, but as far as just what the actual generation mix is, there are numbers available from Medi where even if they have some kind of bucket they're trying to group things into, they do show the breakdown by category that does make the distinctions that we're talking about now. 
Okay. Yeah. It is, it's not, it's not easy to understand. I'm glad there's experts like you in the field who are going through all this data, trying to make it understandable for us. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the best practice companies that seem to be on target for 2030 or 2050 targets. Uh, on your website, you talk about Eon Group, the shopping mall retailer. I've been very impressed with them. Uh, talked to uh, Eric the other day about Loop and TerraCycle, they're doing collaboration with Eon Group to use reusable containers in all their malls. It's really exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned JAL and JIDA and NEX, NEC. Can you talk a little bit about some companies which seem to be focused on these targets, trying to hit them? Yeah, so uh, Eon is, um, is really, it, it's, one of my favorite examples because they're such a, a well-known presence in Japanese society and because what they're doing is pretty straightforward and easy to understand. So obviously that they're, um, they're a retailer who most of us encounter in our day-to-day -day lives and um, what they're doing is largely driven by um, installing solar panels uh, generally at their retail uh, locations. So this, um, in many cases, this may not be uh, enough to cover their 24-hour power demand, but it sure covers a meaningful chunk of it. And then uh, it provides some measure of resilience uh, in, you know, in case of uh, grid power outages, which is uh, particularly meaningful when you're talking about a grocery store. Right, so you keep uh, you keep the food from uh, going bad. You keep the place operating uh, because al although these are uh, businesses, they're also part of what you call our lifeline in Japan. There, it's an essential service we all need to to stay alive. And I'm I'm pretty sure that they've started adding um, batteries in some cases. They're probably adding um, uh, EV chargers at the parking lots at some of their locations. So it's doing a lot of great things and it's very, it's very visible and understandable and it does it raises it in the public, public consciousness. So I um, really appreciate what they're doing. Yeah. Um, one one other thing before you move on, I'm I'm very impressed with is they're doing the EV charging system, um, where you can pay as you go, and if you have an electric vehicle in Japan, there is good access to charging infrastructure, but it is confusing, and most of the systems you need to buy a monthly membership, uh, working out how to do it. But Eon Group is making it really easy you buy one of their cards and you charge it there and you can use it. You don't have to worry about the monthly fees. So that's another way that they're supporting the customer trying to make more sustainable choices, which is nice to see. Yeah, it is. And, you know, in uh, the best case scenario, um, I'm not sure which system they're using, but uh, given how widespread they are, maybe other companies who have space to host chargers uh, rather than tying it up in a highly proprietary membership system, maybe, maybe they'll see a benefit in going the way Eon has and, and we'll see e even more of the, the uh, pay-as-you-go model. Um, I would love to see that. <laughs> yeah, be nice. Yeah. Another great example at uh, more of an industrial level is um, what uh, parts of the NTT group are doing. So they've, um, they already own renewable generation. Can't remember how much, but it's a significant amount. They've earmarked a lot of money to continue developing more renewable generation in the coming years. And also, uh, they own microgrids on their own industrial facilities. So 
since the events of the typhoon season in 2019, they have been actively moving towards making their um, power supply facilities because uh, in, in many cases, they have some power generation. Uh, well, by definition, if it's a microgrid, it should have power generation on it. Might be solar, might not always be solar, um, but they are looking at how to make this power available to the local communities around them in times of outage. So they are, I, I believe they were doing some programs where, you know, first of all, they want to connect with uh, hospitals and other critical local facilities so that uh, in, in times of need, in times of outage, they can pump some power out to uh, support the local community. Um, there are a, a lot of um, smaller scale versions of this happening around the country too. Uh, I think we'll see them continuing to spread, but I just wanted to highlight the NTT example. One, because it's big, we're gonna be seeing it uh, all over the place, but two, because um, it's a, we're talking about a little bit more of a big, bad corporate, you know, huge behemoth company uh, sort of image around them. Um, and they're doing meaningful things too. That's one of the things that you often talk about is how slow moving a lot of the big businesses are in Japan. And this, this is a kind of a difficult thing to understand, especially when you work with international businesses who want to get things done in a really short amount of time. You, you must find that a lot in your international consultancy, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's um, the, you know, th th I think the question is always, do we try to explain this up front? and have them start kind of assimilating it into their thinking? Or do we, do we just need to let them run into the, the glass sliding door that's in front of them and get a bloody nose? And then, you know, uh, come, come say, oh, well, we, uh, we see what you're talking about now. Can you help us figure this out? <laughs> um, oh no, but that said on your website as well, you do talk about, the target for carbon neutrality by 2050, which has been adopted by municipalities between September 2019 to December 2020, there's been huge gains there. That's really impressive from 15% of the population being represented in these municipalities aiming towards 2050 goals to now 70% of the population coverage. That's awesome. It, it's a it's amazing and um, there is so much impact that um, municipal governments can have um, when it when it comes to if not financially incentivizing but in uh, facilitating right I mean we unfortunately, we've had a growing number of municipalities over the last several years who have put in place some kind of ordinance at some level banning renewables development in their communities. Um, in some cases, uh, we've had silly things that are overblown, but um, in other cases, uh, it's like, yeah, but uh, you know, because of land constraints, we have mountains taking a haircut. Uh, thank you, perfect slide. You know, and that leads to landslides and and things like that. So, um, so first of all, uh, it's the municipal governments have a huge role to play in facilitating local buy-in. Uh, by the population. They also have, um, they can serve as the, uh, the linchpin for um, public private partnerships. Um, they may let, they may have the, uh, the leverage with their local utility company 
to say, hey, we want to do something different here. We have this other company with the technology we want to bring in. Can you make a kind of Miyakojima-esque exception for us here? Things like that. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's great. It's really good. Um, it makes the national government uh, look behind if all the municipalities are getting way out way too far ahead of them. So uh, it is just any number of reasons that it, that what you point out is, is a positive thing. Yeah, I, I was really surprised by that. Uh, the whole idea not in my backyard for solar farms or solar energy. And I just think of solar as future tech that everybody would want because it's clean. Once it's set up, all you need is sunshine and free energy comes after your investment pays off, right? But there was a lot of backlash like you talk about, about uh, people thinking it's ugly or cause of landslides or dirty water. So having the transparency, like you say, again, but also having clear communication between stakeholders, local people, and the policymakers, and really going back and forth with their concerns and and having clear information they can understand, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Um, you just made me think of um, a point in the new basic energy plan, which uh, I haven't I haven't picked apart at a quantitative level yet but uh i know that the target to what to have um solar panels on the rooftops of all new homes built by 2030 something like that is part of uh how uh, this uh, additional solar capacity is uh, intended to be put in place and i don't know have you done uh an episode yet talking about Japanese housing because it is one of the ironies. Um, I've talked with a couple of uh, friends and companies from overseas who go rooftops on new homes. How much can you really do there? And I said, well, more than you would think since houses here are sort of plastic and aren't expected to stand for more than about 20 years you know um is so, that was, that's a new rule that's just coming in now right any new right. building and i know that hawaii and california maybe also did this uh any new build you have to have either a percentage of the roof is covered in solar panels or somehow you have to have an investment in renewable energy, and it seems like a no-brainer, something we yeah, need to do. It is. I think what, what's yet to be seen is um, how, um, how basically, how is this going to be financially facilitated? Um, so on the one hand, um, when it comes to solar panels for rooftops, since the, the panel of the set, it, itself is the main cost factor maybe we'll be doing better on that cost wise in japan than we are on large scale where the construction costs for the sites are so much of it but also um it'll be interesting to see what uh what kind of incentives uh come out be it, be it for uh for homeowners for the um the constructors and the housing, um, I like to call them the housing manufacturers, since so much of housing is kind of manufactured here in Japan. But then um, companies like Daiwa House also, um, they own uh, commercial scale solar plants. They own electricity retail companies. So the um, the idea of the more rooftop solar um, creates uh, opportunities, I think, not only for the, the, be the benefit of the power generation uh, on, on your rooftop at, at the most basic level, but also 
you just think of the structure of the housing and real estate industry here. Let's say Daiwa House, just as one example, is going to go build some new um, uh, summer cottage development down, um, you know, in, up in Tochigi or down in Izu or, or wherever. If they're building it from the ground up with the intention to have uh, panels on all rooftops, maybe uh, some larger solar, some storage, and then they've set things out from the outset with the utility that this is going to be their own microgrid. Um, yeah, housing and real estate developers, I think, will ultimately have a really uh, important role to play in, um, in these uh, local, self-sufficient, uh, resilient energy communities. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh, solar farms for a second there. Um, so a lot of solar farms were set up, like you said, right when Japan's energy market became deregulated so they could make money from the feed-in tariff by having a big solar farm and getting the money for that. Um, what I've heard recently is a lot of these farms are kind of derelict, that the companies who built them, they're not really getting any gains. They don't care about them. They're being overrun by weeds. Um, what's going to happen to these farms? Are, are there businesses that see, well, the cost has already been covered. It's already been built. It's already connected to the grid. Or we could connect it to batteries or local businesses and give them clean, cheaper energy. Um, what's, what's the plan? Do you know anything about this? Yeah, so there's um, a booming, what we call it, secondary solar market, the, the buying and selling of existing plants. Um, so there are, I, I think the, the, the first layer of what we see happening is just those plants, which um, whatever investments are going to be necessary to get them uh, running optimally again, uh, still leave you with uh, the ability to make a profit, uh, continuing to run them through the remaining life uh, of, the, of their feed-in tariff contracts. But then there are a number of regulatory changes, um, which I won't get into, but which uh, could create new new way new ways that companies can come in and recoup their investments uh, on these existing plants. Um, so if, if you assume we, we have this huge amount of, uh, of solar and a lot of it is underperforming, then in reaching our decarbonization goals, um, there, I mean, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna cover the whole thing, but if we can squeeze a couple more percent of generation out of the plants that are already there, that's meaningful. So I, I hope we're going to see policy and regulatory changes um, facilitating that as well. Uh, I hope so. Um, we just have a few more minutes. Uh, can you just touch on the transition from feed-in tariff to feed-in premium, sure. FIT to FIP? Sure. So the feed-in tariff was this system, you build the plant, and TEFCO or whoever's there is going to buy it from you above market for 20 years. All of us energy consumers are paying for that above market difference out of our electricity bills. Uh, feed and premium, uh, first of all, the premium they can get is not going to be as high as the premiums that were available in the early days of feed and tariff. So first, there's this, this assumption that costs have come down somewhat, so we're starting at a lower point. But rather than having uh, the utility, just buy all your power for 20 years uh, from a, a solar plant you build. You, as the uh, developer and owner of the plant, you have to find an off-taker for your power, someone who's going to buy it through a contract you could find uh, a, um, a business, uh, 
it, it could be a, a large scale business, could be a factory, could be a data center, uh, could I, I think maybe 7-Eleven is or Lawson's is doing some of this. Um, or you can sell it into the wholesale market. And then on top of whatever price you're selling it for there, you receive a premium. So rather than we consumers um, paying for this, something like this, it's going to be smaller, it's going to be variable, and it's going to be sitting on top of a varying market price. Um, so there is market exposure uh, for these, uh, these solar plants that didn't exist under the old system. Uh, our financial analysis has shown that uh, averaged over the course of a year, you will actually get whatever number your, your premium was specified at even though it seems like the two are going like this, but there are uh, a num there are some other risks and also some operational burdens that didn't exist. You're a market participant now, whereas before you were building a plant and leaving it there under this artificial system created in a bubble and just kind of you know, watching the numbers running on a screen. Um, so it's de it's uh, it's dealing with these new variabilities and also the very different uh, business model of actually having to be a part direct participant in the wholesale and retail markets, which uh, well, which honestly has become um, our biggest area of business recently. Uh, until recently, uh, a lot of solar developers were going around and just trying to vacuum up whatever was left under the feed-in tariff system that was big enough and at a high enough rate to be worthwhile. But for large-scale solar, we're really kind of coming to the end of that. And now we're hearing companies like Amazon and Google and a, a larger num number of Japanese companies talking about wanting to be able to directly procure green power. So developers are saying, okay, time to bite the bullet and prepare to uh, learn to operate in this more complex uh, environment. So um, uh, I, don't, I don't know how they feel about it, but we sure, we sure love working with them. Yeah. That's great. No, I think that's really exciting. And it's, it's, it's really nice to see this happening and to see big companies getting more involved in taking on their choices before compliance, right? Before the regulation comes in, right. um, they're getting ahead of the curve and saying, we're gonna do this and already be ready when the new rules and regulations come. They must see new rules and regulations are coming soon because of 2030, targets and 2050 targets right so it's it seems like good business strategy yeah i mean i um i agree especially here in japan where um before anything ever actually happens they've been talking about the fact that it might happen in the news for for at least 10 days you know th this is obviously stretched out on a longer timeline but it's like, yeah, the, the writing's on the wall um, and, uh, and companies are trying to figure out um, how to move in that direction before, it's, um, before they're prescriptively told exactly how they need to move in that direction. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights about this very complicated but very exciting part of sustainability, renewable energy in Japan. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you so much for having me. It was uh, a pleasure talking with you. And um, I'm, uh, I'm honored to be included uh, alongside uh, a lot of uh, very other uh, interesting conversations you've had with uh, such a wide variety of people.
Well, thank you so much. And I just feel like we've only scratched the surface. We didn't even talk about really EV, um, you know, assets moving into the future, power storage, uh, biomass. So I'd love to have you on again sometime and, and catch up on those other topics. That would be my pleasure. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, Dan. And thank you everybody for joining today and uh, join us again next time. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dan.